A chill books original. Moral Letters to Lucilius, or Letters from a Stoic, by Seneca. Letters 22 to 28. Translated by Richard M. Gama. Letter 22, on the futility of halfway measures. 1. You understand by this time that you must withdraw yourself from those showy and depraved pursuits. But you still wish to know how this may be accomplished. There are certain things which can be pointed out only by someone who is present. The physician cannot prescribe by letter the proper time for eating or bathing. He must feel the pulse. There is an old adage about gladiators that they plan their fight in the ring. As they intently watch, something in the adversary's glance, some movement of his hand, even some slight bending of his body, gives a warning. Two, we can formulate general rules and commit them to writing as to what is usually done or ought to be done. Such advice may be given not only to our absent friends, but also to succeeding generations. In regard, however, to that second question, when or how your plan is to be carried out, no one will advise at long range. We must take counsel in the presence of the actual situation. Three, you must be not only present in the body, but watchful in mind. If you would avail yourself of the fleeting opportunity, accordingly, look about you for the opportunity. If you see it, grasp it, and with all your energy and with all your strength, devote yourself to this task, to rid yourself of those business duties. Now listen carefully to the opinion which I shall offer. It is my opinion that you should withdraw either from that kind of existence or else from existence altogether. But I likewise maintain that you should take a gentle path, that you may loosen rather than cut the knot which you have bungled so badly in time, provided that if there shall be no other way of loosening it, you may actually cut it. No man is so faint-hearted that he would rather hang in suspense forever than rot once for all. 4. Meanwhile, and this is of first importance, do not hamper yourself. Be content with the business into which you have lowered yourself, or, as you prefer to have people think, have tumble. There is no reason why you should be struggling on to something further. If you do, you will lose all grounds of excuse, and men will see that it was not a tumble. The usual explanation which men offer is wrong. I was compelled to do it. Suppose it was against my will. I had to do it, but no one is compelled to pursue prosperity at top speed. It means something to call a halt, even if one does not offer resistance, instead of pressing eagerly after favoring fortune. 5. Shall you then be put out with me, if I not only come to advise you, but also call in others to advise you, wiser heads than my own, men before whom I am wont to lay any problem upon which I am pondering? Read the letter of Epicurus which bears on this matter. It is addressed to Idomeneus. The writer asks him to hasten as fast as he can and beat a retreat before some stronger influence comes between and takes from him the liberty to withdraw. 6. But he also adds that one should attempt nothing except at the time when it can be attempted suitably and seasonably. Then, when the long-sought occasion comes, let him be up and doing. Epicurus forbids us to doze when we are meditating escape. He bids us hope for a safe release from even the hardest trials, provided that we are not in too great a hurry before the time, nor too dilatory when the time arrives. 7. Now, I suppose, 
you are looking for a stoic model also. There is really no reason why anyone should slander that school to you on the ground of its rashness. As a matter of fact, its cashin is greater than its courage. You are perhaps expecting the sect to utter such words as these. It is base to flinch under a burden. Wrestle with the duties which you have once undertaken. No man is brave and earnest if he avoids danger, if his spirit does not grow with the very difficulty of his task. 8. Words like these will indeed be spoken to you, if only your perseverance shall have an object that is worth while. If only you will not have to do or to suffer anything unworthy of a good man. Besides, a good man will not waste himself upon mean and discreditable work or be busy merely for the sake of being busy. Neither will he, as you imagine, become so involved in ambitious schemes that he will have continually to endure their ebb and flow. Nay, when he sees the dangers, uncertainties, and hazards in which he was formerly tossed about, he will withdraw, not turning his back to the foe but falling back little by little to a safe position. 9. From business, however, my dear Lucilius, it is easy to escape, if only you will despise the rewards of business. We are held back and kept from escaping by thoughts like these. What then? Shall I leave behind me these great prospects? Shall I depart at the very time of harvest? Shall I have no slaves at my side? No retinue for my litter? No crowd in my reception room? Hence men leave such advantages as these with reluctance. They love the reward of their hardships, but curse the hardships themselves. 10. Men complain about their ambitions as they complain about their mistresses. In other words, if you penetrate their real feelings, you will find, not hatred, but bickering. Search the minds of those who cry down what they have desired, who talk about escaping from things which they are unable to do without. You will comprehend that they are lingering of their own free will in a situation which they declare they find it hard and wretched to endure. 11. It is so, my dear Lucilius. There are a few men whom slavery holds fast, but there are many more who hold fast to slavery. If, however, you intend to be rid of this slavery, if freedom is genuinely pleasing in your eyes, and if you seek counsel for this one purpose, that you may have the good fortune to accomplish this purpose without perpetual annoyance, how can the whole company of Stoic thinkers fail to approve your course? See no, Chrysippus, and all their kind will give you advice that is temperate, honorable, and suitable. 12. But if you keep turning round and looking about, in order to see how much you may carry away with you, and how much money you may keep to equip yourself for the life of leisure, you will never find a way out. No man can swim ashore and take his baggage with him. Rise to a higher life with the favor of the gods. But let it not be favor of such a kind as the gods give to men when with kind and genial faces they bestow magnificent ills, justified in so doing by the one fact that the things which irritate and torture have been bestowed in answer to prayer. 13. I was just putting the seal upon this letter, but it must be broken again in order that it may go to you with its customary contribution, bearing with it some noble word. And lo, here is one that occurs to my mind. I do not know whether its truth or its nobility utterance is the greater. Spoken by whom, you ask, by Epicurus. For I am still appropriating other men's belongings. 15. 
No one, he says, leaves this world in a different manner from one who has just been born. That is not true. For we are worse when we die than when we were born. But it is our fault, and not that of nature. Nature should scold us, saying, What does this mean? I brought you into the world without desires or fears, free from superstition, treachery, and the other curses. Go forth as you were when you enter. 16. A man has caught the message of wisdom, if he can die as free from care as he was at birth. But as it is, we are all aflutter at the approach of the dreaded end. Our courage fails us, our cheeks blanch, our tears fall, though they are unavailing. But what is baser than to fret at the very threshold of peace? 17. The reason, however, is that we are stripped of all our goods. We have jettisoned our cargo of life and are in distress. For no part of it has been packed in the hold. It has all been heaved overboard and has drifted away. Men do not care how nobly they live, but only how long, although it is within the reach of every man to live nobly, but within no man's power to live long. Farewell. Letter 23 on the true joy which comes from philosophy. 1. Do you suppose that I shall write you how kindly the winter season has dealt with us, a short season and a mild one, or what nasty spring we are having, cold weather out of season, and all the other trivialities which people write when they are at a loss for topics of conversation? No. I shall communicate something which may help both you and myself. And what shall this something be? If not an exhortation to soundness of mind, do you ask what is the foundation of a sound mind? It is not to find joy in useless things. I said that it was the foundation. It is really the pinnacle. Two. We have reached the heights if we know what it is that we find joy in, and if we have not placed our happiness in the control of externals. The man who is goaded ahead by hope of anything, though it be within reach, though it be easy of access, and though his ambitions have never played him false, is troubled and unsure of himself. 3. Above all, my dear Lucilius, make this your business. Learn how to feel joy. Do you think that I am now robbing you of many pleasures when I try to do away with the gifts of chance, when I counsel the avoidance of hope, the sweetest thing that gladdens our hearts? Quite the contrary. I do not wish you ever to be deprived of gladness. I would have it born in your house, and it is born there if only it be inside of you. Other objects of cheer do not fill a man's bosom. They merely smooth his brow and are inconstant, unless perhaps you believe that he who laughs has joy. The very soul must be happy and confident, lifted above every circumstance. 4. Real joy, believe me, is a stern matter. Can one, do you think, despise death with a carefree countenance, or with a blithe and gay expression, as our young dandies are accustomed to say? Or can one thus open his door to poverty, or hold the curb on his pleasures, or contemplate the endurance of pain? He who ponders these things in his heart is indeed full of joy. But it is not a cheerful joy. It is just this joy, however, of which I would have you become the owner for it will never fail you when once you have found its source. 5. The yield of poor minds is on the surface. Those are really rich whose veins lurk deep, and they will make more bountiful returns to him who delves unceasingly. So too those baubles which delight the common crowd afford but a thin pleasure, 
laid on as a coating, and every joy that is only plated lacks a real basis. But the joy of which I speak, that to which I am endeavoring to lead you, is something solid, disclosing itself the more fully as you penetrate into it. 6. Therefore I pray you, my dearest Lucilius, do the one thing that can render you really happy. Cast aside and trample underfoot all those things that glitter outwardly and are held out to you by another or as obtainable from another. Look toward the true good, and rejoice only in that which comes from your own store. And what do I mean by from your own store? I mean from your very self, that which is the best part of you, the frail body, also, even though we can accomplish nothing without it, is to be regarded as necessary rather than as important. It involves us in vain pleasures, short-lived, and soon to be regretted, which, unless they are reined in by extreme self-control, will be transformed into the opposite. This is what I mean, pleasure unless it has been kept within bounds, tends to rush headlong into the abyss of sorrow. But it is hard to keep within bounds in that which you believe to be good. The real good may be coveted with safety. 7. Do you ask me what this real good is and whence it derives? I will tell you. It comes from a good conscience, from honorable purposes, from right actions, from contempt of the gifts of chance, from an even and calm way of living which treads but one path, for men who leap from one purpose to another, or do not even leap but are carried over by a sort of hazard. How can such wavering and unstable persons possess any good that is fixed and lasting? 8. There are only a few who control themselves and their affairs by a guiding purpose. The rest do not proceed. They are merely swept along, like objects afloat in a river. And of these objects, some are held back by sluggish waters and are transported gently. Others are torn along by a more violent current. Some, which are nearest the bank, are left there as the current slackens and others are carried out to sea by the onrush of the stream. Therefore, we should decide what we wish and abide by the decision. 9. Now is the time for me to pay my debt. I can give you a saying of your friend Epicurus and thus clear this letter of its obligation. It is bothersome always to be beginning life or another which will perhaps express the meaning better. They live all who are always beginning to live. 10. You are right in asking why. The saying certainly stands in need of a commentary. It is because the life of such persons is always incomplete. But a man cannot stand prepared for the approach of death if he has just begun to live. We must make it our aim already to have lived long enough. No one deems that he has done so if he is just on the point of planning his life. 11. You need not think that there are few of this kind. Practically everyone is of such a stamp. Some men, indeed, only begin to live when it is time for them to leave off living. And if this seems surprising to you, I shall add that which will surprise you still more. Some men have left off living before they have begun. Farewell. Letter 24 On Despising Death 1. You write me that you are anxious about the result of a lawsuit with which an angry opponent is threatening you and you expect me to advise you to picture to yourself a happier issue and to rest in the allurements of hope. Why, indeed, is it necessary to summon trouble, which must be endured soon enough when it has once arrived, 
or to anticipate trouble and ruin the present through fear of the future. It is indeed foolish to be unhappy now because you may be unhappy at some future time. 2. But I shall conduct you to peace of mind by another route. You would put off all worry, assume that what you fear may happen will certainly happen in any event. Whatever the trouble may be, measure it in your own mind and estimate the amount of your fear. You will thus understand that what you fear is either insignificant or short-lived. 3. And you need not spend a long time in gathering illustrations which will strengthen you. Every epoch has produced them. Let your thoughts travel into any era of Roman or foreign history. And there will throng before you notable examples of high achievement or of high endeavor. You lose this case. Can anything more severe happen to you than being sent into exile or led to prison? Is there a worse fate that any man may fear than being burned or being killed? Name such penalties one by one, and mention the men who have scorned them. One does not need to hunt for them. It is simply a matter of selection. 4. Sentence of conviction was borne by Rutilius as if the injustice of the decision were the only thing which annoyed him. Exile was endured by Metilius with courage, by Rutilius even with gladness. For the former consented to come back only because his country called him. The latter refused to return when Sulla summoned him, and nobody in those days said no to Sulla. Socrates in prison discoursed and declined to flee when certain persons gave him the opportunity. He remained there in order to free mankind from the fear of two most grievous things, death and imprisonment. 5. Musius put his hand into the fire. It is painful to be burned, but how much more painful to inflict such suffering upon oneself. Here was a man of no learning, not primed to face death and pain by any words of wisdom and equipped only with the courage of a soldier who punished himself for his fruitless daring. He stood and watched his own right hand falling away piecemeal on the enemy's brazier. Nor did he withdraw the dissolving limb with its sun-covered bones until his foe removed the fire. He might have accomplished something more successful in that camp, but never anything more brave. See how much keener a brave man is to lay hold of danger than a cruel man is to inflict it. Corsina was more ready to pardon Musius for wishing to slay him than Musius to pardon himself for failing to slay poor Sinna. 6. Oh, say you, those stories have been droned to death in all the schools. Pretty soon, when you reach the topic on despising death, you will be telling me about Cato. But why should I not tell you about Cato, how he read Plato's book on that last glorious night, with a sword laid at his pillow? He had provided these two requisites for his last moments. The first, that he might have the will to die, and the second, that he might have the means. So he put his affairs in order as well as one could put in order that which was ruined and near its sin, and thought that he ought to see to it that no one should have the power to slay or the good fortune to save Cato. 7. Drawing the sword, which he had kept in stain from all blood shed against the final day, he cried, Fortune, you have accomplished nothing by resisting all my endeavors. I have fought, till now, for my country's freedom, and not for my own. I did not strive so doggedly to be free, but only to live among the free. Now, since the affairs of mankind are beyond hope, let Cato be withdrawn to safety. 8. So saying, he inflicted a mortal wound upon his body. 
after the physicians had bound it up. Kato had less blood and less strength, but no less courage. Angered now not only at Caesar, but also at himself, he rallied his unarmed hands against his wound and expelled, rather than dismissed, that noble soul which had been so defiant of all worldly power. 9. I am not now heaping up these illustrations for the purpose of exercising my wit, but for the purpose of encouraging you to face that which is thought to be most terrible, and I shall encourage you all the more easily by showing that not only resolute men have despised that moment when the soul breathes its last, but that certain persons, who were craven in other respects, have equaled in this regard the courage of the bravest. Take, for example, Scipio, the father-in-law of Mius Pompeius. He was driven back upon the African coast by a head wind and saw his ship in the power of the enemy. He therefore pierced his body with a sword. And when they asked where the commander was, he replied, all is well with the commander. 10. These words brought him up to the level of his ancestors and suffered not the glory which fate gave to the Scipios in Africa to lose its continuity. It was a great deed to conquer Carthage, but a greater deed to conquer death. All is well with the commander. Ought a general to die otherwise, especially one of Cato's generals? 11. I shall not refer you to history or collect examples of those men who throughout the ages have despised death, for they are very many. Consider these times of ours whose innervation and over-refinement call forth our complaints. They nevertheless will include men of every rank, of every lot in life, and of every age, who have cut short their misfortunes by death. Believe me, Lucilius. Death is so little to be feared that through its good offices nothing is to be feared. 12. Therefore, when your enemy threatens, listen unconcernedly, although your conscience makes you confident. Yet, since many things have weight which are outside your case, both hope for that which is utterly just and prepare yourself against that which is utterly unjust. Remember, however, before all else, to strip things of all that disturbs and confuses, and to see what each is at bottom. You will then comprehend that they contain nothing fearful except the actual fear. 13. What you see happening to boys happens also to ourselves who are only slightly bigger boys. When those whom they love, with whom they daily associate, with whom they play, appear with masks on, the boys are frightened out of their wits. We should strip the mask, not only from men, but from things, and restore to each object its own aspect. 14. Why dost thou hold up before my eyes swords, fires, and a throng of executioners raging about them? Take away all that vain show, behind which thou lurkest and scarest fools. Uh, thou art not but death, whom only yesterday a man servant of mine and a maid servant did despise. Why dost thou again unfold and spread before me with all that great display, the whip and the rack? Why are those engines of torture made ready, one for each several member of the body, and all the other innumerable machines for tearing a man apart piecemeal? Away with all such stuff, which makes us numb with terror. And thou, silence the groans, the cries, and the bitter shrieks ground out of the victim as he is torn on the rack. Forsooth thou art naught but pain, scorned by yonder gout-ridden wretch, Endured by yonder dyspeptic in the midst of his dainties, borne bravely by the girl in travail. Slight thou art, if I can bear thee. Short thou art, if I cannot bear thee. 15.
ponder these words which you have often heard and often uttered. Moreover, prove by the result whether that which you have heard and uttered is true. For there is a very disgraceful charge often brought against our school, that we deal with the words, and not with the deeds, of philosophy. What? Have you only at this moment learned that death is hanging over your head, at this moment exile, at this moment grief? You were born to these perils. Let us think of everything that can happen as something which will happen. 16. I know that you have really done what I advise you to do. I now warn you not to drown your soul in these petty anxieties of yours. If you do, the soul will be dulled and will have too little vigor left when the time comes for it to rise. Remove the mind from this case of yours to the case of men in general. Say to yourself that our petty bodies are mortal and frail. Pain can reach them from other sources than from wrong or the might of the stronger. Our pleasures themselves become torments. Banquets bring indigestion, carousals paralysis of the muscles and palsy. Sensual habits affect the feet, the hands, and every joint of the body. 17. I may become a poor man. I shall then be one among many. I may be exiled. I shall then regard myself as born in the place to which I shall be sent. They may put me in chains. What then? Am I free from bonds now? Behold this clogging burden of a body to which nature has fettered me. I shall die, you say. You mean to say I shall cease to run the risk of sickness. I shall cease to run the risk of imprisonment. I shall cease to run the risk of death. 18. I am not so foolish as to go through at this juncture the arguments which Epicurus harps upon, and say that the terrors of the world below are idle, that Ixion does not whirl round on his wheel, that Sisyphus does not shoulder his stone uphill, that a man's entrails cannot be restored and devoured every day. No one is so childish as to fear Cerberus, or the shadows, or the spectral garb of those who are held together by naught but their unfleshed bones. Death either annihilates us or strips us bare. If we are then released, there remains the better part, after the burden has been withdrawn. If we are annihilated, Nothing remains. Good and bad are like removed. 19. Allow me at this point to quote a verse of yours, first suggesting that, when you wrote it, you meant it for yourself no less than for others. It is ignoble to say one thing and mean another. And how much more ignoble to write one thing and mean another. I remember one day you were handling the well-known commonplace that we do not suddenly fall on death, but advance towards it by slight degrees. We die every day. 20. For every day a little of our life is taken from us. Even when we are growing, our life is on the wane. We lose our childhood, then our boyhood, and then our youth. Counting even yesterday, all past time is lost time. The very day which we are now spending is shared between ourselves and death. It is not the last drop that empties the water clock, but all that which previously has flowed out. Similarly, the final hour when we cease to exist does not of itself bring death. It merely of itself completes the death process. We reach death at that moment, but we have been a long time on the way. 21. In describing this situation, you said in your customary style, for you are always impressive, but never more pungent than when you are putting the truth in appropriate words. Not single is the death which comes. The death 
which takes us off, is but the last of all. I prefer that you should read your own words rather than my letter. For then it will be clear to you that this death, of which we are afraid, is the last but not the only death. 22. I see what you are looking for. You are asking what I have packed into my letter, what inspiriting saying from some master mind, what useful precept. So I shall send you something dealing with this very subject which has been under discussion. Epicurus upbraids those who crave, as much as those who shrink from, death. It is absurd, he says, to run towards death because you are tired of life when it is your manner of life that has made you run towards death. 23. And in another passage, what is so absurd as to seek death, when it is through fear of death that you have robbed your life of peace? And you may add a third statement, of the same stamp. Men are so thoughtless, nay, so mad, that some, through fear of death, force themselves to die. 24. Whichever of these ideas you ponder, you will strengthen your mind for the endurance alike of death and of life. For we need to be warned and strengthened in both directions, not to love or to hate life over much. Even when reason advises us to make an end of it, the impulse is not to be adopted without reflection or at headlong speed. 25. The brave and wise man should not beat a hasty retreat from life. He should make a becoming exit, and above all, he should avoid the weakness which has taken possession of so many, the lust for death. For just as there is an unreflecting tendency of the mind towards other things, so, my dear Lucilius, there is an unreflecting tendency towards death. This often seizes upon the noblest and most spirited men, as well as upon the craven and the abject. The former despise life, the latter find it irksome. 26. Others also are moved by a satiety of doing and seeing the same things, and not so much by a hatred of life as because they are cloyed with it. We slip into this condition, while philosophy itself pushes us on, and we say, How long must I endure the same things? Shall I continue to wake and sleep, be hungry and be cloyed, shiver and perspire? There is an end to nothing. All things are connected in a sort of circle. They flee and they are pursued. Night is close at the heels of day, day at the heels of night. Summer ends in autumn, winter rushes after autumn, and winter softens into spring. All nature in this way passes, only to return. I do nothing new. I see nothing new. Sooner or later one sickens of this also. There are many who think that living is not painful, but superfluous. Farewell. Letter 25 on Reformation. 1. With regard to these two friends of ours, we must proceed along different lines. The faults of the one are to be corrected. The others are to be crushed out. I shall take every liberty. For I do not love this one if I am unwilling to hurt his feelings. What, you say, do you expect to keep a forty-year-old ward under your tutelage? Consider his age, how hardened it now is, and pass handling. 2. Such a man cannot be ratiated. Only young minds are molded. I do not know whether I shall make progress but I should prefer to lack success rather than to lack faith. You need not despair of curing sick men even when the disease is chronic. If only you hold out against excess and force them to do and submit to many things against their will. As regards our other friend, I am not sufficiently confident. 
either, except for the fact that he still has sense of shame enough to blush for his sins. This modesty should be fostered. So long as it endures in his soul, there is some room for hope. But as for this veteran of yours, I think we should deal more carefully with him, that he may not become desperate about himself. 3. There is no better time to approach him than now, when he has an interval of rest and seems like one who has corrected his faults. Others have been cheated by this interval of virtue on his part, but he does not cheat me. I feel sure that these faults will return, as it were, with compound interest. For just now, I am certain they are in abeyance, but not absent. I shall devote some time to the matter and try to see whether or not something can be done. 4. But do you yourself, as indeed you are doing, show me that you are stout-hearted, lighting your baggage for the march. None of our possessions is essential. Let us return to the law of nature, for then riches are laid up for us. The things which we actually need are free for all, or else cheap. Nature craves only bread and water. No one is poor according to this standard. When a man has limited his desires within these bounds, he can challenge the happiness of Jove himself. As Epicurus says, I must insert in this letter one or two more of his sayings. 5. Do everything as if Epicurus were watching you. There is no real doubt that it is good for one to have appointed a guardian over oneself and to have someone whom you may look up to, someone whom you may regard as a witness of your thoughts. It is, indeed, nobler by far to live as you would live under the eyes of some good man, always at your side. But nevertheless I am content if you only act, in whatever you do, as you would act if anyone at all were looking on. Because solitude prompts us to all kinds of evil, 6. And when you have progressed so far that you have also respect for yourself, you may send away your attendant. But until then, set as a guard over yourself the authority of some man, whether your choice be the great Cato or Scipio, or Laelius, or any man in whose presence even abandoned wretches would check their bad impulses. Meantime, you are engaged in making of yourself the sort of person in whose company you would not dare to sin. When the same has been accomplished and you begin to hold yourself in some esteem, I shall gradually allow you to do what Epicurus, in another passage, suggests. The time when you should most of all withdraw into yourself is when you are forced to be in a crowd. 7. You ought to make yourself of a different stamp from the multitude. Therefore, while it is not yet safe to withdraw into solitude, seek out certain individuals. For everyone is better off in the company of somebody or other, no matter who, than in his own company alone. The time when you should most of all withdraw into yourself is when you are forced to be in a crowd. Yes, provided that you are good tranquil, and self-restrained man. Otherwise, you had better withdraw into a crowd in order to get away from yourself. Alone, you are too close to a rascal. Farewell. Letter 26 On Old Age and Death 1. I was just lately telling you that I was within sight of old age. I am now afraid that I have left old age behind me, for some other word would now apply to my years, or at any rate to my body. Since old age means a time of life that is weary rather than crushed, you may rate me in the worn out class of those who are nearing the end. 2. Nevertheless, 
I offer thanks to myself, with you as witness. For I feel that age has done no damage to my mind, though I feel its effects on my constitution. Only my vices, and the outward aids to these vices, have reached senility. My mind is strong and rejoices that it has but slight connection with the body. It has laid aside the greater part of its load. It is alert. It takes issue with me on the subject of old age. Declares that old age is its time of bloom. Free, let me take it at its word and let it make the most of the advantages it possesses. The mind bids me do some thinking and consider how much of this piece of spirit and moderation of character I owe to wisdom and how much to my time of life. Bids me distinguish carefully what I cannot do and what I do not want to do. For why should one complain or regard it as a disadvantage if powers which ought to come to an end have failed? 4. But, you say, it is the greatest possible disadvantage to be worn out and to die off, or rather, if I may speak literally, to melt away, for we are not suddenly smitten and laid low. We are worn away, and every day reduces our powers to a certain extent. But is there any better into it all than to glide off to one's proper haven? When nature slips the cable, not that there is anything painful in a shock and a sudden departure from existence. It is merely because this other way of departure is easy, a gradual withdrawal, I, at any rate, as if the test were at hand and the day were come which is to pronounce its decision concerning all the years of my life, watch over myself and commune thus with myself. 5. The showing which we have made up to the present time, in word or deed, counts for nothing. All this is but a trifling and deceitful pledge of our spirit, and is wrapped in much charlatanism. I shall leave it to death to determine what progress I have made. Therefore, with no faint heart, I am making ready for the day, putting aside all stage artifice and actor's rouge. I am to pass judgment upon myself, whether I am merely declaiming brave sentiments, or whether I really feel them, whether all the bold threats I have uttered against fortune are a pretense and a farce. 6. Put aside the opinion of the world. It is always wavering and always takes both sides. Put aside the studies which you have pursued throughout your life. Death will deliver the final judgment in your case. This is what I mean. Your debates and learned talks, your maxims gathered from the teachings of the wise, your cultured conversation, all these afford no proof of the real strength of your soul. Even the most timid man can deliver a bold speech. What you have done in the past will be manifest only at the time when you draw your last breath. I accept the terms. I do not shrink from the decision. 7. This is what I say to myself, but I would have you think that I have said it to you also. You are younger, but what does that matter? There is no fixed count of our years. You do not know where death awaits you, so be ready for it everywhere. 8. I was just intending to stop, and my hand was making ready for the closing sentence. But the rites are still to be performed, and the traveling money for the letter dispersed. And just assume that I am not telling where I intend to borrow the necessary sum. You know upon whose coffers I depend. Wait for me but a moment, and I will pay you from my own account. Meanwhile, Epicurus will oblige me with these words. Think on death, or rather, if you prefer the phrase, on migration to heaven. 9. The meaning is clear, 
that it is a wonderful thing to learn thoroughly how to die. You may deem it superfluous to learn a text that can be used only once. But that is just the reason why we ought to think on a thing. When we can never prove whether we really know a thing, we must always be learning it. 10. Think on death. In saying this, he bids us think on freedom. He who has learned to die has unlearned slavery. He is above any external power, or, at any rate, he is beyond it. What terrors have prisons and bonds and bars for him? His way out is clear. There is only one chain which binds us to life, and that is the love of life. The chain may not be cast off, but it may be rubbed away, so that, when necessity shall demand, nothing may retard or hinder us from being ready to do at once that which at some time we are bound to do. Farewell. Letter 27 On the Good Which Abides 1. What, say you, are you giving me advice? Indeed, have you already advised yourself, already corrected your own faults? Is this the reason why you have leisure to reform other men? No, I am not so shameless as to undertake to cure my fellow men when I am ill myself. I am, however, discussing with you troubles which concern us both, and sharing the remedy with you, just as if we were lying ill in the same hospital. Listen to me, therefore, as you would if I were talking to myself. I am admitting you to my inmost thoughts, and am having it out with myself, merely making use of you as my pretext. 2. I keep crying out to myself, count your years, and you will be ashamed to desire and pursue the same things you desired in your boyhood days. Of this one thing make sure against your dying day. Let your faults die before you die. Away with those disordered pleasures which must be dearly paid for. It is not only those which are to come that harm me, but also those which have come and gone just as crimes, even if they have not been detected when they were committed, do not allow anxiety to end with them. So with guilty pleasures, regret remains even after the pleasures are over. They are not substantial, they are not trustworthy. Even if they do not harm us, they are fleeting. 3. Cast about rather for some good which will abide. But there can be no such good except as the soul discovers it for itself within itself. Virtue alone affords everlasting and peace-giving joy. Even if some obstacle rise, it is but like an intervening cloud, which floats beneath the sun but never prevails against it. 4. When will it be your lot to attain this joy? Thus far, you have indeed not been sluggish, but you must quicken your pace. Much toil remains. To confront it, you must yourself lavish all your waking hours and all your efforts if you wish the result to be accomplished. This matter cannot be delegated to someone else. 5. The other kind of literary activity admits of outside assistance. Within our own time, there was a certain rich man named Calvisius Sabinus. He had the bank account and the brains of a freedman. I never saw a man whose good fortune was a greater offense against propriety. His memory was so faulty that he would sometimes forget the name of Ulysses or Achilles or Priam names which we know as well as we know those of our own attendants. No major domo in his dotage who cannot give men their right names, but is compelled to invent names for them. No such man, I say, calls off the names of his master's tribesmen so atrociously as Sabinus used to call off the Trojan and Achaean heroes. But none the less did he desire to appear learned. 6. 
So he devised this shortcut to learning. He paid fabulous prices for slaves, one to know Homer by heart and another to know Hesiod. He also delegated a special slave to each of the nine lyric poets. You need not wonder that he paid high prices for these slaves. He did not find them ready to hand, he had them made to order. After collecting this retinue, he began to make life miserable for his guests. He would keep these fellows at the foot of his couch and ask them from time to time for verses which he might repeat and then frequently break down in the middle of a word. 7. Satilius Quadratus, a feeder and consequently a fauner, upon adopated millionaires, and also for this quality goes with the other two a flouter of them, suggested to Sabinus that he should have philologists to gather up the bits. Sabinus remarked that each slave cost him 100,000 cestuses. Satilius replied, You might have bought as many bookcases for a smaller sum, but Sabinus held to the opinion that what any member of his household knew, he himself knew also. 8. The same Satilius began to advise Sabinus to take wrestling lessons, sickly, pale, and thin as he was, Sabinus answered, How can I? I can scarcely stay alive now. Don't say that, I implore you, replied the other. Consider how many perfectly healthy slaves you have. No man is able to borrow or buy a sound mind. In fact, as it seems to me, even though sound minds were for sale, they would not find buyers. Depraved minds, however, are bought and sold every day. 9. But let me pay off my debt and say farewell. Real wealth is poverty adjusted to the law of nature. Epicurus has this saying in various ways and contexts. But it can never be repeated too often, since it can never be learned too well. For some persons, the remedy should be merely prescribed. In the case of others, it should be forced down their throats. Farewell. Letter 28. On travel as a cure for discontent. 1. Do you suppose that you alone have had this experience? Are you surprised, as if it were a novelty, that after such long travel and so many changes of scene you have not been able to shake off the gloom and heaviness of your mind? You need a change of soul rather than a change of climate, though you may cross vast spaces of sea. And though, as our Virgil remarks, lands and cities are left astern, your faults will follow you whithersoever you travel. 2. Socrates made the same remark to one who complained. He said, Why do you wonder that globe trotting does not help you, seeing that you always take yourself with you? The reason which set you wandering is ever at your heels. What pleasure is there in seeing new lands, or in surveying cities and spots of interest? All your bustle is useless. Do you ask why such flight does not help you? It is because you flee along with yourself. You must lay aside the burdens of the mind. Until you do this, no place will satisfy you. 3. Reflect that your present behavior is like that of the prophetess whom Virgil describes. She is excited and goaded into fury, and contains within herself much inspiration that is not her own. The priestess raves, if haply she may shake the great God from her heart. You wander hither and yon, to rid yourself of the burden that rests upon you though it becomes more troublesome by reason of your very restlessness. Just as in a ship the cargo when stationary makes no trouble, but when it shifts to this side or that, it causes the vessel to heal more quickly in the direction where it has settled. 
Anything you do tells against you, and you hurt yourself by your very unrest, for you are shaking up a sick man. 4. That trouble once removed, all change of scene will become pleasant. Though you may be driven to the uttermost ends of the earth, in whatever corner of a savage land you may find yourself, that place, however forbidding, will be to you a hospitable abode. The person you are matters more than the place to which you go. For that reason, we should not make the mind a bondsman to any one place. Live in this belief. I am not born for any one corner of the universe. This whole world is my country. 5. You saw this fact clearly. You would not be surprised at getting no benefit from the fresh scenes to which you roam each time through weariness of the old scenes. For the first would have pleased you in each case, had you believed it wholly yours. As it is, however, you are not journeying. You are drifting and being driven, only exchanging one place for another, although that which you seek to live well is found everywhere. 6. Can there be any spot so full of confusion as the Forum? Yet you can live quietly even there, if necessary. Of course, if one were allowed to make one's own arrangements, I should flee far from the very site and neighborhood of the Forum. For just as pestilential places assail even the strongest constitution, so there are some places which are also unwholesome for a healthy mind which is not yet quite sound, the recovering from its ailment. 7. I disagree with those who strike out into the midst of the billows, welcoming a stormy existence, wrestle daily in hardihood of soul with life's problems. The wise man will endure all that, but will not choose it. He will prefer to be at peace rather than at war. It helps little to have cast out your own faults if you must quarrel with those of others. 8. Says 1. There were 30 tyrants surrounding Socrates, and yet they could not break his spirit. But what does it matter how many masters a man has? Slavery has no plural. And he who has scorned it is free, no matter amid how large a mob of overlords he stands. 9. It is time to stop, but not before I have paid duty. The knowledge of seeing is the beginning of salvation. The saying of Epicurus seems to me to be a noble one, for he who does not know that he has sinned does not desire correction. You must discover yourself in the wrong before you can reform yourself. 10. Some boast of their faults. Do you think that the man has any thought of mending his ways who counts over his vices as if they were virtues? Therefore, as far as possible, prove yourself guilty. Hunt up charges against yourself. Play the part, first of accuser, then of judge, last of intercessor. At times be harsh with yourself. Farewell. Chill books. Audiobooks with relaxing music, visuals, and subtitles to help you stay engaged. <laughs>